Hello and in this video we're going to look at the C++ family tree. Computer programming languages have been around since the 1950s really. They've undergone a very long process of evolution and we're going to have a look in this lecture at how we arrived at C++. This may sound like a bit of a pointless history lesson but in fact it is very relevant to understanding why C++ is the way it is today. So let's start in the beginning, and in the beginning there was machine code. So these are just binary numbers which are fed straight into the CPU and translate directly into voltages. This is a very difficult way for humans to work, dealing with lots and lots of numbers which don't mean anything or don't seem to mean anything. So after a few years someone realised this wasn't terribly good and they had a very clever idea. They wrote a, pr a programme called an assembler so you could feed words into this and it would generate the numbers. So instead of entering the CPU instruction code that's meant compare to two numbers, you could enter the word CMP, which stood for compare, and then the two numbers. And that would uh, spit out the corresponding machine code instruction for the CPU. So this is a lot easier for humans to work with the disadvantages are it's pretty verbose if you want to do something like uh, I don't know open a file for example that takes quite a lot of assembly instructions it's very low level it's very much oriented towards thinking the way that CPUs think and not the humans way that way that, way that humans think oh, I mean CPUs don't really think but uh, you know what I mean <laughs> and the big problem is it's not supportable because the assembly language is different for every CPU as the machine code is different as well so if you wanted to write an assembly language program and then use it on a different computer you basically had to rewrite the program which is uh, takes a lot of time and then uh, someone had the idea of taking this a step further so this is this is still in the 1950s and they wrote another program called a compiler so you could enter words into that and then it would uh, generate assembly language then you could feed that into your assembler and it would generate the machine code and then you could run your program this is portable because you can just uh, rig up your compiler so it generates the appropriate type of assembly language for the computer that you're working on it's concise you can have a single instruction in a high level language that corresponds to several assembly language instructions for example you can just say open file and that'll generate all the assembly language instructions that you need to do that and it's getting a bit closer to thinking in terms of uh, human concepts so you can have sort of concepts such as opening files or uh, reading in data or whatever as opposed to just sort of poking around in memory and sending off in instructions so the first high-level languages were Fortran and COBOL. There were quite a lot of them in the 60s and later. And the one that we're particularly interested in for C++ is a language called C. This was developed around 1970 in Bell Labs, which is a subsidiary of the giant American telecommunications company AT&T. They were writing their own operating system at the time, which became known as Unix and they also decided to write their own compiler. They did start off in assembler, but they wanted to be able to have it running on different computers, so that's why they went to a high-level language. C has often been described as a high-level assembler, so you can write in it as a high-level language, but there are also instructions which correspond to a single assembly or machine code instruction. So you can still have quite a lot of fine grain control over the actual code that goes into the CPU which is just what you want when you're writing an operating system and you have to poke around with the hardware and make things very efficient. It is a procedural language only, that's the only paradigm it supports. It's good for low-level programming hardware because you can do all this uh, high-level assembly language. There's a bit of a drawback though because Unix became very widely used and the C compiler was supplied with Unix because you had to be able to compile it on your system yourself. They didn't supply binaries in those days. So this meant you had a compiler. If you wanted something like Fortran or Pascal or some other language, 
you either had to buy it off someone else, which was very expensive, or else you'd have to write it yourself, which took a lot of time. So people started writing application programs in C. This was not such a good idea, because the low-level features for poking around with hardware were still in there, so this tended to create very buggy programs. And also, procedural language, as people wrote more and more complicated programs, procedural programs tend to get out of control, and this created a lot of uh, unmaintainable programs. So, in the late 1970s, the origins of C++ started. This was also at at and but in a different department. They were actually replacing their old telephone switches with new ones which were software controlled. So a telephone switch is something that's in a telephone exchange. When you make a telephone call, it goes to the exchange and it gets sent off to another exchange and so on until it gets to the one nearest the person that you're calling. And the switches basically decide which uh, is the next exchange that the call should be passed on to. So they wanted a software system to control these software switches. It was obviously going to be a very large and complicated program, and they didn't really fancy doing it in C. So they came up with the idea of adding things called objects or classes to C. And they brought in someone called Bjorni Straustrup from Denmark. He had already, already written an object-oriented language called Simula. So the new C with classes was based on that. And gradually it developed into a and took on a life its, its own, so it became called C++, because it's uh, the next thing after C. There's a little uh, geeky joke in there which uh, you might not appreciate. But, uh, you have to understand C++ to, under to uh, understand it, really. <laughs> so C++ was designed for to be more, enjoy more pleasant than C when writing large programs. So it kept all the features of being a high-level assembler, really. It's basically a superset of the C language. I mean, C has diverged very slightly since then, but you can still compile almost any C program with a C++ compiler. So here is the C++ family tree. So we start off with machine code, then we have assembly language, then we have C, which is a high-level language, and Simula is also a high-level language. And then they evolved into C++, which is another high-level language. So perhaps we should really have C++ at the same level here, but it looks a bit confusing. You can't really have the children in the same generation as the parents. So finally, let's have a quick look at the standardization of C++. C was standardized in 1989. The reason for that was there were lots of different versions of C around, and it was a real nuisance trying to get having programs that compiled with some comp C compilers and not with others. So they came up with a standard compiler, and every compiler had to comply with the standard, so you could be assured that your program would compile with it. C++ was rather different because AT&T had their own compiler called Cfront, and they made this available free of charge. So people could write their own C++ programs, and that was the standard. If your program compiled with C++, C front, it was C++. If it didn't compile, then it wasn't C++. This is a bit unsatisfactory because AT&T kept introducing changes, and every time they changed the compiler, people's code stopped working, or they had to get a new compiler to use the new features. And also, AT&T got a bit tired of uh, being in control of the standard. It's not really what they wanted to do. So they... Uh, got involved with the International Standards Organization as well, and in 1998 they produced the first C++ standard. So the most notable feature of this was the standard template library, or STL. In 2003 the standard was revised. Mainly this was the actual uh, language itself. There were a lot of errors in the standard, places where it didn't say what it was supposed to say. In terms of actual changes to the language, they're very, very small. 2011 was a very big revision. There are lots of new features, and lots of improvements to existing features. In fact, uh, it's almost a new language. This is often referred to as modern C++. So that's very 
relevant to us because we're learning modern C++ and we're also learning it the modern way. 2014 is another revision, just a, a few small changes this time. 2017 was supposed to be another really big change. There are lots of new features bringing in all the other things that people in other languages have in languages like Java and C hash. But uh, it's a bit too ambitious and the time scale was much too short. So they ended up not actually doing most of them. These have all been put off to the next revision. I've put that as 2020x. The convention is that you write the decade followed by the letter X, just to show that you're not quite sure when it's coming out. Uh, 2011 was originally 2000x. It's supposed to be 2008, but it's, uh, like all the best software projects, it was uh, <laughs> got behind schedule. This one's supposed to be in 2020, and it should have all the exciting things that we were promised in 2017. So that's it for this video. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time.